over here leak testing this guy and I forgot to tighten the rotor lock gasket on the freaking I'm wondering why I'm leaking this video is brought to you by Sportland quality integrity and tradition We have a walk-in freezer service call today, and uh, they say that it's high in temp. I can tell that there's no frost on the coil. It's dripping. The temp control does not have a display back there. So, at this point, I'm gonna double check that switch, and then we are gonna jump onto the roof. Well, we have a master-built refrigeration rack. Um, it's kind of a crappy design, but I believe my walk-in freezer compressor is right there. And let's see. If that's the sign of anything else. I'm sure this condenser is nice and dirty. Um, I believe system B. Yeah, that's my walk-in freezer. Negative 10. Yeah. So this isn't a good sign. Uh, I open it up. It looks like it might have been in defrost. And my breaker's tripped. It's always scary when you have a trip breaker on a walk-in freezer. What they're doing, they tie in the ice machine condensers into this rack. And there's no electrical communication. So the ice machine condensers need to be running if the ice machines are on. So I went downstairs, turned off the ice machines. And I'm going to shut down this entire rack so I can troubleshoot. So. Okay. Remember, a tripped breaker, you have to turn it off first before you can reset it. All right, at this point, we're gonna open up the rack, take a look inside, look for any direct shorts on the compressor or anything like that. Um, because it looked like it might have been in defrost, we're gonna investigate the defrost circuit. And then uh, it looks like defrost termination is unhooked possibly too don't know why we'll have to look into that that's just sitting there I'm assuming that's for the walk-in freezer it's hard to say it looks like maybe the beer walk-in has a defrost termination too but that one's hooked up because there's an X so I'm thinking that this I don't know that's an awfully big wire to go into that oh no you know what looks like there's a defrost termination unhooked right there that would make more sense that this would go to this one because it fits the lengthwise and then this went to that. Looks like someone's just clipping defrost terminations. But the crappy thing is, is that you never want to hook those up unless you know what happened. So even though it's disconnected, I'm not just going to hook it up and walk away. So we're going to finish diagnosing. We know that the defrost termination is not hooked up. So, you know, we'll just add that to our list of things that need to be fixed. What we're going to do is start by checking three phase power into the rack. 209, 208, 210. So we have three phase power coming into the rack. Next thing you do is we're gonna check three phase power coming into the uh, breaker. 209, 210, 209. So we got three phase power coming into the breaker. I'm gonna switch this over to tone. And we're gonna check for shorts to ground coming out of the breaker. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Now we're gonna to go to the contactor, going in. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Now we're gonna go out of the contactor. Line one, nothing. Line two, nothing. Line three, nothing. So we have no direct shorts to ground so far going into the compressor. Now let's go ahead and test direct shorts to ground at the uh, um, time clock. Nothing, 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 nothing. And again, we have good continuity. So no direct shorts to ground up here. We're gonna investigate the compressor and then we'll go downstairs. 
All right, I'm about to go downstairs, but I just kind of want to look at a few things down here and I notice a few red dead giveaways. Look down here, there's oil everywhere. I moved this out. It looks like we've got a rub through. We've got a rub, look at all that oil on my finger. So that's not good. Um, the compressor itself, my goodness gracious, look at the overheating. Look at the stickers. This bad boy's hating life right now. Um, coming back here, Look at that, that's nice. But look down there, there's some oil all over that too. Back in here. This thing is not liking life right now. There's a lot of stuff. And then check this out, look what I noticed. Look at this head pressure control valve. Someone's clipped the tip on it. So I can get you a better image of that. Someone has clipped the power head so that head pressure control valve doesn't do anything anymore. I've had some history with this walk-in freezer, but I can't remember if I noted that head pressure control valve being clipped or not. I know that uh, I've, when I first took over this store, there was a lot of problems with this. Overheat issues, someone had disconnected the thermostat for the compressor, all kinds of different things. But, but yeah, this thing's got a, a messy situation going on. Um, but still, we're going to start downstairs, investigate everything down there. It's like Pandora's box. Look, there's no chase nipple here. But it doesn't look like there's any shorts, but we got to fix that. I was tripping. I was worried that this uh, low pressure control was disconnected via because I see this oil right here. But it's not. They're just uh, wiring it in series with this uh, compressor thermostat. The discharge line thermostat right here is wired in series through the dual pressure control so all right so i get down to the evaporator coil and there's a bunch of ice in here fan motors all spin but yeah the drain pan it's just the drain pan though and it's like half the drain pan it's weird so we might have a plugged up drain or something it's hard to say but i did see this look right here that wire is zip tied to the fan motor bracket in a way that it might rub out so we're going to open that up um, but yeah, that's interesting. It's only iced up in the front where the drain pan heaters are not at. I'm gonna move that bag. This is full of ice. So it looks like the drain's been leaking. Maybe we got a plugged up drain, but again, plugged up drain doesn't necessarily mean an electrical short. So I pulled the zip tie and there's a little nick right there. You can't tell if it's rubbed through or not, but it, um, it looks like I can see copper. So I'm gonna dig into it a little bit more and see if that's a short or not. Kind of feels like there's a nick right here too from where it shorted. This is kind of a pain in the butt, but the first step is to slowly let the water drain out of the drain pan, what is actually water. It's got a ways to go. And then once that drains out, I'll probably have to dump the pan a few times. I'll start getting the ice out. So I'm slowly, I broke it, drained what was in there. Kind of makes me think it's plugged up, cut my finger too, but look back in here. I can get this. It's like drain pans full of plastic. There's a bunch of plastic in there. And there's a whole bunch more. So there's the problem. Of course, it's how this will go. This thing is teed in with other drains and it's uh, plugged up with chunks of crap. Ugh, what a mess, man. All right, so we've got, this is the other side, this is their walk-in cooler, and we've got multiple drains connected. So that's the walk-in freezer coming from over there. When I go down to where it comes to the floor drain, it won't budge when I blow from there. And then when I blow into this, it just backs up into this other walk-in cooler drain. So in order to properly do this by myself, I need to make some fittings that blank these off, and then I can blast from here and hopefully clear the line. But for now, I've actually got to stop um, because this is going to take me some time and I need to get the freezer running. So we're going to, uh, finish with the electrical short and ignore this for the time being. It's really hard to ignore this because when I blew from in the walk-in cooler on the other side of that wall, it just filled up the drain pan in here. Grr. And see, this is the kind of stuff that's frustrating because I haven't even, this isn't what I can't, like, I highly doubt this ice or this water was the service call. You know what I'm saying? Like it was the electrical short. We need to figure out where the short is. In the meantime though, I'm seeing a lot of like chafed wires. See that, that, that. 
interesting. So we're gonna tape all that stuff up, but um, I'm gonna fire this guy up. I turned the power switch off downstairs, so let's see what happens here. Compressor's running. It's going into defrost, I can hear it. So it's going into pump down. Well, at least we know it's not a shorted compressor. There's oil. It sounds like we just pumped down. I think. I think I heard the contactor kick out. Oh no. Breaker tripped. Grr. That's not good. Why did the breaker trip? Man. Hopefully this doesn't turn out to be a bad compressor. Hmm. Okay. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to disconnect the compressor at the terminal block. Fire it up again and see if it trips. Man, it is not my lucky day. We got continuity to ground. Why it didn't show up over at the compressor contactor, I don't know. Man, this sucks. All right, well, I'm back. Um, I'm gonna have to change this compressor. I already picked it up. It took me, I've been gone about three hours. Uh, the compressor was about 50 miles away and then, you know, all that stuff. But anyways, picked up the compressor, got the recovery machine up here. I'm gonna hook it up. But before I recover all the gas, I'm gonna do a quick leak check on that oily spot back there. And I will be, uh, cause I don't have a head pressure control valve. I'm gonna be cutting the head pressure control valve out of the system completely. Um, temporarily, just because I don't want it to be a leak point, because that could be a leak point too. And remember I said that the someone had clipped the head on it, and I don't know why. I don't know if it failed or what. All right, we are set up to recover. Um, I've already purged it over here. I've already zeroed out my scale on here. So zero. There we go. So my scale readout's there, so I know how much gas I recover. Go ahead and open up my tank. There's already refrigerant in there. I'm pushing in through the vapor port to try to make it go faster. All right, let's go ahead and zero it again. All right, there we go. Hit start. It's in recover mode. I'm gonna go ahead and start getting compressor, sanded up, ready to go, pulled over here, pressure control, all that good stuff, so. At least it's uh, nice outside. It's probably about 60 degrees right now. Energize this here in a little while, so gotta separate everything. This is my uh, switch. I don't know if I'm putting that switch back in because it looks like crap. We might come back with another one. Recovered somewhere around 10 pounds of gas. It's interesting because the refrigerant doesn't smell burnt. It, it must have just internally shorted. I'm gonna try to get everything ready before I cut the compressor open so that way uh, the least amount of moisture is getting in there. So watch out because there's probably gonna be a flame out right here. Yeah, not too bad though. So I got the compressor out and I've got to figure out piping because the dryer is going to be a little different. The head pressure control valve needs to come out. I'm slowly cutting some stuff out and check this out. This thing flamed out man. There's a ton of oil stuck in the liquid line. I already poured out a bunch. So. Yeah, there's an oil issue here somewhere. So the entire time I'm pulling this head pressure control valve out, there's oil coming out of this condenser. Everywhere. Out of the receiver, out of everything. So we're gonna give this guy a little blast and see what we can get out of it. Okay, well, I thought 
Thought we were gonna get a ton of stuff out of there, but I guess not. All right, so I'm sweeping with nitrogen right now. Not always perfect, but I try. being lazy and not getting my road bug tip out so both of those joints real quick looks good looks good looks good looks good baby steps we got the compressor kind of in brazed in I know that I cut out the uh, head pressure control valve temporarily and uh, I need to reroute the liquid line. The sight glass and dryer is gonna go where it is instead of the up and down position because there was a big old oil trap there. It was full of oil, so. We're gonna eliminate that. It's not gonna be as convenient for looking at the sight glass, but it's okay. All right, let's see if we can weld this guy. Turn on the nitrogen again. Should be flowing all the way downstairs. I've got the uh, power on to the system, so the liquid line solenoid valve downstairs is energized. And we're flowing nitrogen, so. One last braze joint, and I want to cool the sight glass so it doesn't overheat. And if I didn't screw up, we should be done brazing now. All right, so We've still got to support this somehow. I gotta, I'll put a bracket right here or something like that. We'll do something. But our DTC valve is repiped. The dryer, I did that because I didn't like the big trap that was going down because that dryer trap was full of oil. So I eliminated that trap from the picture. So yeah, we'll clean everything up, straighten everything up. I'm gonna get a vacuum going on this bad boy first.
I'm over here leak testing this guy and I forgot to tighten the rotolock gasket on the freaking. I'm wondering why I'm leaking. All right, got the vacuum pump running. Gas ballast open until I see a good drop in uh, microns. I'm gonna start uh, cleaning stuff up, hooking up electrical, but I'm gonna let the, uh, I'm gonna wait to do the electrical till the end. So that way I can let the vacuum pump run with the solenoid valve open downstairs. Um, I don't wanna hook that up yet, so I'll clean up everything else. I need to come up with a bracket set up for this. I might have to do that when I come back. This might work somehow, but I think I need to cut it down and do something. If I cut it down, that'll probably work some sort. It's not too bad, but that's my roof hatch going up. And then you got this room right here. So it's not like it's horrible. It's just like you're, you're ducking and you know, doing your whatever. But um, this is where the hook really comes into play. Drop things down, grab the next thing, bring it up. You know, that way you don't gotta go up and down and up and down to unhook things. So really dig that hook. So I just finished up with my vacuum. And what I did was I went ahead and hooked up my manifold to the vacuum pump because I'm gonna charge the system with my manifold. And I wanted to get the manifold down uh, so it wouldn't ruin the evacuation that the system has in it. Got my scale zeroed out and we're gonna go ahead and open up the high side and start charging into the receiver. Uh, you know what? I gotta shut my system off because I have power turned on to it. All right. Let's go ahead and add some refrigerant into the high side. I took out about 10 pounds. So we'll at least put in probably, I don't even have 10 pounds in the cylinder, so we'll put in what it'll take and then go get another cylinder from my van. Did a startup without the uh, condenser fan motor so that I can hear the compressor running. Looks like we're cutting in at 20, cutting out at 10. We'll probably need to adjust that a little bit, but I'm gonna go ahead and fire up the condenser fan motor. And we're gonna finish charging this guy. We're running now. All right, um, last I checked, we had a clear sight glass. I'm gonna let it keep running for a few minutes. Um, I need to go ahead and turn on the rest of the rack because this rack's been off for like three, four hours. So um, turn them on one at a time, nice and slow. The design of this rack is really dumb because, you know, unless you got probes, it's almost impossible to have your gauges and be able to, it's just dumb. Because of the way it's designed, the air is pulling through here, so when you take a panel off, you bypass the condensers, it's just dumb. It's running, it's making a god-awful racket. Something's rattling, I'll have to fix that, but at least we got a walk-in freezer again. The oil sight glass was like all the way full, so I just pulled a little bit out. Look at how nasty that oil looks. We're definitely coming back to change the dryer, and we might do an oil change too. It, it's funny. It didn't smell too burnt. It's it doesn't even smell burnt either, but that oil is just baked. And that's probably from the old compressor. It probably came back. Keep an eye on it, check on it when I come back. But yeah, that doesn't look too hot. Okay, we're back and uh, here's my little mechanism that we're gonna use to blow out the drain. So they're gonna connect to the existing using union. This is a hose adapter, so I can put the water hose and these are end caps for the other coils. So let's see how this goes. So this is what we got going on and uh, we're gonna blow through and we capped off the other sides. And these are caps. Now this drain line was full, these drain pans. We had to drain it into a bucket. Well, it wasn't full, but he already poured some out. But um, yeah, those are the caps. So that way it blows and pressurizes and blows the other way. I wanted to do it down here, but it's a one inch. I didn't realize it was one inch and I don't have that. All right, now we got some stuff coming out now there was a chunk that came out but it already washed down the drain but yeah we've got hot water now flowing so we're gonna back flush all the other drains 
and then uh, we'll be done. All right, we're back up on the roof and we are going to change this dryer right here. And then we are also going to go ahead and do a quick oil change. It won't take much. Um, I thought maybe it was overfilled, but no, it doesn't look too bad. It's, it's right below three quarters. So yeah, we're good. Um, so my only problem, I was thinking about it right now, is I didn't bring an acid test kit with me. So if I can, I'll save some of that oil. But yeah, it's really hard to save it though. We'll see. But anyways, we're gonna uh, pump it down real quick, change the dryer, and then do an oil change. All right, so we did a quick dryer change, um, and we changed the oil that we could get out of the system. We couldn't do a full oil change because I can't tip the compressor over. So we drained out as much as we could for now. That oil does not look very pretty for being a brand new compressor. Unfortunately, like I said, I don't have an acid test kit, but I did change the dryer, and check this out. We, we're still on a positive pressure because we're still, uh, basically have refrigerant vapor in the oil and yeah i'm gonna pull a quick vacuum on it but nothing crazy because there's no point so i'm just gonna pull it through my manifold real quick put it into a negative and all right so um like i said i'm just pulling a quick vacuum just to get into negative pressure we're not going to see microns at all because look at i'm still pulling refrigerant out of this i just wanted to make sure there was no trapped air right here okay all right so this is my system right now we're gonna go ahead and clean the condenser real quick so we're 334 head I'd say it's probably about 90 degrees outside right now so so this is what the condensers look like they're pretty bad so we're gonna clean them real quick all right we did our best you can kind of see through it now um, still got a lot of water we're letting it drain out we just have the condenser fan motors running right now but yeah this thing was nasty um, over here I mean, you know, we blew through from the inside out, two people watching it, so yeah, it's there. So we're gonna start this compressor back up now. All right, so this is our system right now. We've got all of our numbers on there. Let's just scroll through and see what we got going on right now. So we're running about 10 degrees, 11 degrees evaporator superheat. The box is still pulling down to temp, okay? So that's acceptable. We're gonna go through. It's about 100 degrees, 96-ish degrees outside. We got a 200 degree discharge line temp. That's pretty good. Um, return air temperature in the box is about two degrees. It's set to maintain about negative 10, negative five, somewhere in there. We are running a clear sight glass. I still gotta come up with a solution for that liquid line. Um, oil level is looking good. Everything's cool. We're gonna wrap this one up. We'll probably talk him into letting us do an oil change again. Man, that one kicked my ass. That ended up being altogether, I think, a 15-hour call. Um, it started out as a service call at like 1 p.m. or something like that on a, I think it was 1 p.m. on a Saturday. Um, you know, it's one of those things I totally forgot about like emergency service calls. It's kind of funny because of this whole virus thing. Like things have been slow and I haven't been getting overtime service calls. And my wife and I were just at home and we were like, we're, you know, got cabin fever going crazy. And uh, we were just getting ready to, uh, believe it or not, I went and purchased a fishing license online. We were going to drive up to a local regional park up in the mountains that has uh, the fishing season opened up. Even though COVID thing is going on, they opened up fishing season. So we were just going to kind of go up there and scope it out. I wanted to see what it was going to be like. And I planned on going back out there Sunday morning really early and going fishing by myself. And we were literally walking out the door on Saturday and then that service call came in and I told my wife like, oh man, I got to go to work. I got to walk in freezer down. I got to go. Okay. So I went and did it and it just turned into a thing, man. So left at like one, got to the location like a two. By the time I went through with the whole short drain line, diagnosing a compressor and then locating where it was at and getting approval. Again, that's a hard thing to get an approval because the customer wants a quote, but it's overtime on a Saturday. Like, how do I quote that? So I just kind of give them like a way big ballpark figure. Um, and then I had to drive like 40 something miles to go get the compressor. And it was just a long thing. So it took me three hours to pick up the compressor and return. And then uh, I think I think I walked in the door at 430 in the morning, I think something like that. And then I think I went to bed at 5 a.m is about right and then i think uh i slept for about five hours i woke up around 10 a.m and it was like okay yeah i felt like crap and um it's been let's see it's wednesday the following week and i'm still like messed up from it that one that one just got me it's just one of those things so we originally went out there we had a call 
uh, found a tripped breaker, but I don't like to reset breakers. So I started investigating. It was very interesting that we didn't find a direct short at the contact or anything. And if you guys watched the video, you saw that it wasn't shorted. It started up and it ran, but then it made like a funky noise and it shorted to ground. So it was already damaged. Something was going on. More than likely, my thought is, is that um, because I tested to ground, but I didn't test the continuity between windings. And I have a feeling that one of the windings was shorted to the other one is probably what happened. And then uh, it ran for a couple seconds and then it just shorted to ground and turned into a thing, right? Um, even though it was late night, I was tired, I was exhausted, I still did my best to try to follow proper refrigeration practices. That's what we do, right? It sucks, but it is what it is. Um, you saw me come back uh, two days later and we blew out the drain line and then we changed the liquid line filter dryer. I did install a high acid. I used a Sporlin 16.4 HH, which is their high acid core, the first time I was there. And then when I returned, I couldn't get my hands on a HH core. So I went ahead and put in a normal um, Sporlin 16.4 flare dryer. And then I went ahead and changed the oil that I could get my hands on. Unfortunately, because it's not a rotolock, uh, I could only drain what was above the fill port, basically. So I drained out a little bit of oil. I showed you guys in the video. It looked pretty nasty. Um, went ahead and replaced it with clean oil. I'd like to go back and do that a couple times because there's really no other way to get that oil that's underneath the drain tube out other than just mixing it with fresh oil and then doing it. Um, I did end up getting a sample of the oil and bringing it back to my house. I have it in a sealed container. So I do plan on still doing an acid test on that. Um, I'm pretty confident we'll find something in there, but I really think that because the previous summer, this is our first kind of like heat wave we're getting right now. In the previous summer, we had some problems with this compressor. I had some overheating issues and different things like that. I kind of think this thing was on its last leg already. Um, and it just kind of limped through the winter. And then the first heat wave that we got, it just took a crap basically. Um, so this thing I think was already damaged inside. Uh, you can see that when I walked up, I showed like the compressor sticker, the heat damage. It was like, you know, it had been overheating big time. Um, so... Yeah, that was an interesting one. I'm sure that the condenser being dirty and stuff had a lot to do with it. Um, and it had a auto reset high pressure control. And I know there's a lot of controversy about me using auto reset high pressure controls, but this is the perfect situation. You know, if even with the cleanest condenser in the middle of the summer uh, on the hottest day, uh, 404A, we might run 425 to 440 head pressure because we get such heat out here. Uh, at that particular location, the summertime temperatures can be about 110 to 115 ambient. And if you figure that condensing temp over ambient is probably gonna be 25 to 30 degrees over ambient, that's a pretty high uh, condensing temp. And so if we had a manual reset on there, I would literally be going out to that customer. They would hate me because I would go out there and reset pressure controls all the time. And I know it seems kind of messed up, but that's just how it has to go. When we have these high ambients, Unfortunately, you know, I would love, I know I can solve it. I could solve it by does, by oversizing these condensers and doing things like that. But the customer, they build these restaurants and they just want to keep them the same. They don't want to reinvent the wheel. I bring stuff up to them all the time. Hey, last summer, I tried to get them to let me pull this compressor off this rack, put in a condensing unit that was bigger because I'm still worried about the condenser and the receiver size. It's, it's too small, but I want to put a bigger condenser unit up there. And they're like, no, just leave it in the rack. It's fine. You know, they have five other locations with this exact prototype across the United States that that they run it in, which, you know, it's hard convincing corporate officials and things that they have other locations that are in Ohio and Denver and places like that where it doesn't get 125 degrees on the roof or 120 degrees on the roof, right? But anyways, you know, it's like beating a dead horse. You just... You, you do what you do, you give them the suggestions, you put it in writing, and then if they choose not to use it or go with your suggestions, then so be it, you know? Although it does kind of suck because I'm the one that's left changing a compressor in the middle of the night, but, you know, anyways. I guess I should be thankful that I have work, right? It is what it is. I really appreciate you guys watching to the end of my rambling rant at the end of this video. Uh, do me a favor, let me know if you guys made it all the way to the end. Uh, I do like to see the people that actually made it to the end. It's interesting. Um... Live streams Monday evening, 5 p.m. Pacific. Do not forget, please, to uh, support the channel. The best way to support the channel is by sharing these videos with other people. Uh, share them on Facebook, email them to people, whatever. 
and click my affiliate links. If you guys are going to purchase tools, you know, through True Tech Tools or something like that, I have a True Tech Tools affiliate link. You can use my offer code, big picture, one word, and uh, you'll help to support the channel. And then you guys don't even have to spend any more money. That's if you guys were already in the market to buy some new tools or something, okay? Um, there's also other ways too. You guys can, uh, um, you know, uh, click my Patreon link. You can, you know, donate to the chapter, I mean, to the, uh, the channel that way, uh, YouTube memberships, things like that. So anyways, really, really appreciate it. We'll catch you guys on the next one. Okay.